Good morning. Come, O sinners, come rejoice. Let me pray for us and we'll get started. Hmm. Father God, thank you for this day. How easy it is for us to become ungrateful or be ungrateful with the simplest of things like a beating heart and a working mind and movable hands and feet. Lord, we're mindful of how you have beautifully orchestrated your created order. And we're mindful of all of the gifts that you give to us every moment, not just every day. And Father God, being true to you, we are mindful of all of the ways that we corrupt and spoil and ruin and misuse your gifts. But Lord Jesus Christ, we are grateful for all that you have done. And as we look at our guilt, we all the more recognize and are overwhelmed by the grace that you afford. Lord Jesus, as we look closely at vices for the next six weeks, as we identify and analyze and reflect and examine our consciences, we ask that you would more and more and more become our Lord. You would more and more and more become our Savior. In every moment of our lives, we would look to you for salvation. There is no one, no one who is righteous but you. And in you we find righteousness. We find salvation. We find wholeness. Lord, may we not be afraid to look closely at our sin. Because in looking closely at our sin, we see your salvation. So be with us, Holy Spirit. Guide our conversations. Guide us to your truth and to your renewal and to your sanctification. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome. It's good to see all of you. Please come on in, have a seat. You have a handful of documents that I hope you won't just dispose of as soon as you get home. I worked relatively hard on some of these, but you have a booklet. The booklet is meant for taking notes. Uh, I've got some, fa- some great quotes that I like, as well as an intro to the class, and then a glossary. I will be using some words within the vice tradition that you may not be familiar with. And instead of continually explaining and defining those, I've just written them down in a succinct manner so you can refer back to them. I am more than happy if in the course of our conversation, when there's a Q&A time, if you want to ask any questions about these definitions or anything in the booklet, I'm happy to do that. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to review all that's in the booklet. But what I do have in there are some key definitions, a theological lexicon, if you will, of how the virtue and vice tradition talks about things. And then I have an uh, explanation of each of the what I'm calling the parent virtues. So in the virtue and vice tradition, they're often called the seven deadly sins, or they're called cardinal virtues. Um, and that word cardinal means head, so the head of something the capital vices, the cardinal vices. And then these minor vices that we're going to talk about are often called daughter vices. So, in the interest of of, um, whatever that might be that's virtuous and shifting here, 
I just want to call them the parent vices and the child vices and the children vices. And so what you have in your booklet is all of the parent vices and a brief explanation of those. In this class, we're going to look at the child vices, the children of these vices, the break-off, itty-bitty, nitty-gritty little things, the minor vices you might call, the minor vices. And so we will spend our class over the next six weeks looking at what pride births, what Acadia births, what envy generates, and so on and so forth. So you may have heard of the parent vices, but maybe not the minor vices or the child vices, and there are many. And I will focus on only a few, but it'll at least whet your appetite and give you a sense of all of these minor vices that come from these major vices. And then I've got just some blank pages for note-taking here over the course of the next few weeks. And um, one of the ways that I've structured this class is, and we'll get into this later, but we're going to focus on the theological virtues, which are faith, hope, and love, and all of the ways that those virtues can go wrong. And then we're going to focus on the, what are called the four philosophical virtues, which the Christian tradition has inherited, received, and used to think about virtuous living and vicious living. Well, within each of those virtues are vicious children. So there's three, there's three kinds of virtues. There's theological virtues, there's intellectual virtues, and there's moral virtues. We're going to focus on the theological and the moral. If you have any questions about the intellectual, we can talk about those. But I'm focused on the theological virtues, and I'm focused on the moral virtues and their vices. So that's how our class is structured. Today, I'll give a brief intro to the virtue and vice tradition. We'll also talk about faith. And I'm, as a shorthand, I'm saying faith gone wrong. Obviously, I'm not personalizing faith and saying that faith can err or something like this. But you get the idea. It's just, it's just a shorthand for the ways in which faith can go bad or not fully be faith. And so it's just a shorthand, faith gone wrong, hope gone wrong, love gone wrong. I'm not insinuating or, you know, that faith, hope, and love are persons, and they can err and make mistakes, and they can sin or anything like that. But there are ways in which faith can go wrong and not be fully faith. And we'll look at some of those today. And then I've paired prudence and justice, which are two moral virtues, together. We'll try to consolidate those into one week. We'll also try to consolidate, consolidate fortitude and temperance in one week. And then the last week, I kind of want to leave open to a Q&A mostly. I'll have some guiding questions for us, but I want that to be a time in which we can breathe. A, breathe, because we're going to go deep and hard into vices and all the mistakes we can make. And we're going to need a moment to come up for air and to breathe. But also, this is going to be a lot. I'm, uh, it's a survey. And there's going to be a lot to digest. And I would just like to have that last week as a cushion. Okay, what do you want to talk about further? What could we explore here? What could we discern and determine together as a church? So I want to leave the last class, week six, open for some further elaboration and discussion. So you've got the booklet. Keep that. Bring that every week with you. You've also got a handout for today, and uh, what we'll be covering today in the virtue and the vice tradition, and you have one more. You have my submission, my course proposal submission to the ACE committee, our adult Christian ed committee, as to what this class is about and whether or not they would like it, and uh, they approved it, so... If you dislike the class, blame them. No, please don't do that. We've got enough problems. Right. Um, but, but you may have this. Read it if you want to know why are we doing this. 
I explained a little bit that uh, uh, I explained a little bit of that in the intro in the booklet, but also this is this is kind of my strategy or my methodology, if you will. This is a class in practical theology. Once again, like I did with my spiritual disciplines class in the fall, I'm going to give you a template and a framework in which Christians have thought about virtues and vices. And what we really want to do is look at our own lives. We want to come down. We're, we're going to get this bird's eye view. And I want us to come down and get a worm's eye view. How am I guilty of blindness of mind or dullness of sense? How am I proud? In what areas in my life, even though I'm not, even though I may not admit I'm envious, do I have envious tendencies? What are those? Right? So our purpose is to get the horizon is to get the template and the framework, but constantly be, be bringing it home or taking it down to get a worm's eye view of how, does this, how, how, does this displ- how is this displayed in my life? Okay. So I talk a little bit about that, and to some degree, insofar as it is, how has the church throughout history talked about virtues and vices? There is a little bit of church history here. But it's mostly practical theology. I'm not giving you a comprehensive discussion of, you know, say what John Cashin said about envy versus Thomas Aquinas and so forth. I'm just giving you a bird's eye view and a survey. And our goal is to to take those nuggets and chew on them a little bit. So that's an explanation of the class and um, how I am approaching the class and, and what I'm hoping to do in the class. Now, I have to admit to you, I've taught a class on a university level on the seven deadly sins and the vices. I've never taught a class on the minor vices. So this is all like kind of new material to me as I'm processing it. Okay? So I want this to be an open space for you to say, wait, what does that mean? Now, that's also, I'm also being selfish in inviting that, too, because I'm actually like flirting with the idea of this being a book. So if it doesn't land with you, I need to figure out how to get it to land with you. So please, feel free to ask me any questions of clarification. I am going to say that if there's any kind of like pushback or, or sort of critical questions, there will be certain spots that I'll outline here. Um, here in a second, uh, in our outline that I would say, hold those questions off for that time. But if it's a question of clarification, what does that mean? Just raise your hand. Okay. I want this to land. I want this to land for a general audience and for you to get it. Um, so that's, that's one of my behind the scenes strategy. Finally, I didn't give you this, but I have a chapter on, uh, I wrote a chapter in a book on confession. Um, and it's about the practice and habit of confession. Now, some things in this class I'm going to kind of assume about confession. The purpose of this class is to get the worm's eye view to say, this is a tendency in my own life. I must confess of this sin. Right? I see confession not just that kind of act between me and God, but confession has a more public and body of Christ implication. There is something powerful and transformative about walking upstairs at 11 o'clock and all of us confessing our sins together. It is a public and political act. Now, if you're, I'm assuming that as we begin to talk about confession. If that's something you're interested in, I can make a copy of this chapter on confession for you, but I just didn't, didn't include it there. It's kind of an ancillary or... Um, a, could possibly a sidetrack for us. But if that is something interesting to you, please let me know, and I am happy to um, reproduce that for you. Okay. Any questions of clarification at this point? Okay. Let's nerd out. I want to give a brief overview of the virtue and vice tradition because for some of us, it might be foreign. It might be strange as it was for me. Growing up in the evangelical church, we never used the language of virtue and vice. But yet a majority of the Christian tradition has. 
And for those of you who may have been brought up in the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church or something like that, you're acquainted with this language. But what's interesting is this is also language that was bequeathed to the magisterial reformers. Um, early on in the Protestant Reformation, they used language of virtue and vice. And over the, co over the course of centuries, we've sort of shed that off like some other views as if like, that smells like Catholicism. Get rid of that, you know. And I think that's lamentable because as I've come to experience in my own life, not only the language of virtue and vice, but all of the virtues and vices is incredibly helpful for thinking about the wrong way of being human, the wrong way of being a follower of Jesus, and the right way of being human, and the right way to follow Jesus. And so it's not that these terms are foreign to Scripture. Last year around this time, Pastor, Pastor Nate you know, showed, showed um, or indicated to us that erite, the word erite, which means excellence, which means virtue, is in the Bible. But all of these words aren't necessarily in the Bible, but that doesn't mean that they're not biblical. Right? All of these sins, all of these vices are in the Bible. And someone like Thomas Aquinas chose to not call them vices exclusively, but they're called sins, the seven deadly sins because they are in the Bible, because they are there. So even though we're going to be using the language of vice, what we really mean is sin. And we mean sin in the sense of it's vicious. It's vicious for us, and it's vicious for others. And insofar as we are vicious, we're doing something horrible to others. We're doing something destructive to creation. So early on in philosophical thought, which was inherited or bequeathed to the early church, you know, the Apostle Paul is engaging with Stoic philosophy. He's engaging with the virtue and vice tradition. Um, the, some of these terms are transliterated in Hebrew. But the mindset in the early church that's bequeathed to them from Greco-Roman thought and from Hebrew thought is there is a particular way that things are meant to be. There's a particular way that, give me one second, Bill. There's a particular way that things are meant to exist and designed to be. The universe is intricately ordered because of God's design. And therefore, the universe is meant to go in a, particular, in a particular way to find its end or to find its perfection. And the language that was used is telos or teleological. There's an end to all of this, and God made it that way. Now, that's the universe. The word cosmos means ordered. It's ordered to go a particular way. And God made it that way. But everything else within the created order also is teleologically oriented. Human beings are meant to become something. Acorns are meant to become something. Squirrels are meant to have some function, some nature within the animal ecosystem. Everything is ordered to its proper end, and I like the language more of fulfillment. Everything that is a creature that is created, that God touches, if you will, everything has a function, a purpose, a nature. Now, what, fast, Bill, give me just one more second to finish this. Fast forward where we're going to go with this is all creatures who do not have a will or do not have choice, they inevitably do what they're supposed to do. An acorn always does what it's supposed to do. 
A squirrel always does what it's supposed to do. A beaver, a bear, etc., etc., etc. We have choice. And we can sin. And we can say, I'm not going that way. And then what we have to consider is when we do that, when we don't fulfill our purpose and function, other things are implicated. Does this make sense? Right? So image bearing becomes all the more significant. What is a human being supposed to be? What is a human being supposed to do? And if we get that wrong, Guess what happens to the created order? This is why the fall is so significant. You know, in talking about the, the fall of, of man, an early, uh, an early church theologian, Irenaeus, would say, you know, Adam and Eve weren't like these rebellious people. They didn't conspire and say, hey, let's not listen to God. Like, let's do our own thing. Irenaeus argued that they were just immature children, really. They didn't know what they were doing. But what they did was devastating for everybody, for everything, for every creature, for all of the order. Because to be created in God's image is to image God to creation. And we have a key role And we have a key capacity to make choices. We can help other creatures fulfill their calling or their purpose more than they could by themselves. To some degree, this is why we own pets. We can give them a better life. We can care for them and tend for them. Does this make sense? Bill. Yes, you said we could ask for clarification. What did you mean by magisterial reform? But like Calvin and Luther, they're often called the teachers of the Reformation, so magisterial. Which era you were going? What's that? I didn't know which era you were talking about. Yeah, so the, yeah, we typically refer to the magisterial reformers as those who are the teachers of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, yep. All right, so... As the virtue and vice tradition was bequeathed to the early church and early Christian theologians, the mindset here was that virtue means that something fulfills its nature and function. And probably the easiest way to communicate this is to talk about a steak knife, which I have on your hand out there. What is a steak knife made for? What's it designed for? To cut steak. And what's the best way to cut steak? Something that's sharp, that will cut a very defined line of the steak and not gnaw it and shred it. And a proper steak knife that fulfills its function and nature would be one in which I could just do it very effortlessly. Isn't it better to cut steak effortlessly than to be, you know, sawing it? Right? So the steak knife is designed through many experiments and designed and designs is designed to cut easily and well. A butter knife is not meant to cut steak. It's meant to butter your bread. And a butter knife, work with me here, a butter knife should not strive to become a steak knife. That's not its nature. It's not designed that way. And that's not its function. So within er early Christian theology and the early church, they're bequeathed this idea that virtue means you're doing what you're supposed to do because you were designed that way. And that is your function in the world. So as they understood things, as they're thinking about squirrels, as they're thinking about the sun, as they're thinking about trees, they're thinking about human beings in this way. We 
have a particular nature. We're not bears. We're not goblins. We're not aliens. We're not gods. We're human beings. What does that mean? We're created in God's image, but we're not God. What does that mean? And how do we do, and proper to that word erite, how do we be human excellently? How do we image God well? So that notion of virtue is bequeathed to them. Well, it's corollary. Vice is also bequeathed to them. There are ways to not be human. There are ways to undermine imaging God. There are ways of living in a destructive way to my nature and to my function in the world. And this is vice. And so fast forward, this is where you get all of this reflection on what is vicious living? What what is a vice for a human? Why does pride hurt me? Well, I mean, if, if I'm just proud, how does my pride destroy order in, in human community or order in creation? So collectively, you begin to have these, okay, pride's a problem. Pride of, uh, pride of life, lust of the flesh, etc., envy, wrath. You begin to see how all of these collect, collective gathering of what it means not to be human, to fall within a particular vice, and then how that manifests other things. So, like, for example, we'll see here in a second, pride. Pride can give rise to heresy. And as we'll talk about heresy, and as I've formulated things in this class, I want to look at the everyday ways you and I are heretics. We typically think of, you know, we hear about somebody like Arius or Nestorius or possibly if we're hardcore, re- hardcore reformed, you know, those Anabaptists and their heresies. But what we don't think about is the principle of heresy, which is an unwillingness to receive the truth, an unwillingness, a choice to not examine your conscience, to not reflect upon the truth. So pride, arrogance, gives rise to an unwillingness to say, hmm, I might be wrong. Do I understand that the right way? Okay, so is that the definition of heresy? No, we'll get there. Some some of it is on your handout. Yeah, no, the minor, no, you're fine. The child vices are not in the glossary, just Yeah, it's on the back of your handout for today. Sorry, I just wanted to understand what you were... Yep, that's fine. So we'll get there. So, you're looking at steak knives and figuring out what their proper nature and function is. And then you're looking at human beings. And you're trying to figure out what their nature and function is. And really what the virtue and vice tradition comes down to is how do you use something? How do you use a chair properly? You know, and as I'm talking to my kids, as I'm talking to Calvin, tables were not meant to be sat on. But it's not just a violation. Don't do that. It's rude, and I don't want you to grow up doing that. It's also, let's think about this here for a second. That's a hardwood table. How's that feel on your butt? Do you enjoy that? You know, he's slipping and sliding on the table. Is that how a chair should be? Can you lean back? 
a table is not a chair because a table is not designed to be a chair. A table is meant to hold things and you eat off of it. A chair is meant to hold your butt. So what's a human being for and how should we use ourselves is what comes up in the virtue and the vice tradition. Now, I do think that as we're talking about virtues and vices, that there is another side to this that's a little more philosophical, a little more theological, but super important. And that is how we understand good and evil. Within the Christian tradition, I think I remember talking about this, I don't know how extensively, for the spiritual disciplines class, but in the Christian tradition, there was this early church heresy that infiltrated the church called Manichaeanism. And, and Manichaeanism was more of a philosophical but religious, very spiritual sect that made its way into the church. And one of the, the devastating, destructive ways it made its way into the church is this view. Good and evil are side by side, duking it out. God and Satan are equals. That's a heresy. And then what that led to is, uh, who's going to win this battle? And then it led to, in the 19th century, all of this is going to go to hell, and then we're going to get raptured. Manichaeanism is still in the church. The Christian view is, here's God, here's Satan. And this whole, angelic we- this whole angelic realm, the created order is hierarchical. And angels have certain powers that we don't have. Satan has certain powers that we don't have. Demons do too. But what you get in the first chapter of Job is Satan walking up to the council to God and saying, can I persecute Job? Satan and God are not equal. Satan has to ask for permission. God is sovereign. There is nothing that happens that is either not by the hand of God or allowed by God. Nothing. That is the Christian view. That is a view of good and evil. Evil, as it came to be called throughout the tradition, evil is a privation of the good. It is when the good isn't or can't be fully itself. It's deprived of its fullness. And bear with me for just one second. I'm not trying to be provocative, but there's nothing absolutely nothing in the created order that is inherently evil. That's also the Christian view, i.e., Satan is not inherently evil. He has to feed off the good. He has to, just bear with me for a second, he has to use the brain God gave him He has to use the brain God gave him to come up with his nefarious strategies of tempting and persecuting you. That brain came from God. Evil is always sucking on the good. It is nothing in and of itself. It's the good corrupted. It's the good misused. You know, we, we talk about demons and we talk about Satan as the accuser. But like for the early church and for most of the church throughout history, they were called fallen angels because they're still angels. That's something that we can forget. So evil 
is a privation of the good. It's a, it's a, uh, the good fallen short of its full fulfillment. Now, that's important for thinking about virtues and vices because you'll see on the handout there that a virtue isn't something over here that I could do. And a vice is something over here that I could do. But a vice is a deviation from something I ought to do. So when you get into, we won't get into this with the, with the capital vices, the parent vices, but there's something good, even if it's this big, there's something good in the vice of pride. What is it? Well, perhaps it's the ability to have confidence. Perhaps it's the ability to be proud of your child because they've walked with the Lord their entire life. There's something in pride that goes this way, but there's something in it that's still virtuous be before it goes this way. Does this make sense? So all of, the vice, all of the vices, they're not over here, and that's a terrible thing. But they're always taking away from the good and going their own way. But there's something in them that can be identified as good. So as you see on your hand out there, on the left, evil is a privation of the good. Vice is a deviation from virtue. Evil and good are not parallels. Evil is not as strong as good. And vices are not all devoid of all good. You know, one of the other ways that the church thought of this, and this might stick with you, it stuck with me, in thinking about good and evil and thinking about virtue and vices. It was, it was often compared to a wall. You have a wall in front of you. Sin and evil is a big hole in the wall. You can see it. Imagine it there. There's a hole in the wall. That hole is evil. The wall is good. Evil is taking away from the wall. It's taking away from the good. But take that image and take that analogy further to its end. The hole can never become the wall. If the hole grew the size of the wall, there would no longer be a wall. And if there's no longer a wall, there's no hole. Evil and vices are holes in the wall. They're there, and they're taking out the good. They're taking out the wall. But they will never be able to take out the entire wall. There will always be more good than evil. In principle, but also because of God's sovereignty. Let me pause there for a second. Questions, comments, concerns, fears, frustrations, deep sighs? Question. Okay. You may have answered it again, but you said something about evil, evil, the whole wall. Took away the wall. Then there would be no wall, which means that you said if there was evil everywhere, then there would be no good, which would mean that evil would no longer be evil. Right. It would not exist. <clears throat> okay. So then. That's what the, the analogy, the analogy in the tradition is meant to say this much. In order to get a hole, you must have a wall. So evil would not exist if there wasn't good. You wouldn't get a fall of Adam and Eve if you didn't have Adam and Eve. But, well, then I'm, I'm stepping a little further then. And if, if that were possible, then we would no longer call it evil, we would call it evil. No, because it wouldn't exist. I mean, the analogy is meant to indicate to you that once the wall is gone, there's no hole. No, 
I mean, the, the, the analogy only goes so far, right? I, I think I get your point that if there's no wall, what do you say about the good, right? But, but the analogy is meant to say the whole can never take the size of the wall. Yeah, so that makes sense to me because if the hole gets big enough and there's no wall up, there's nothing for it to suck on it. Right. So, so it has, it's dependent on something good to distort, mm -hmm. which is corrupt. So if there's nothing there, but it's corrupt, there's nothing it can be. Right. It will always, there will always be a wall there. I mean, I think that's the, the, what the analogy is trying to do. Um, but initially, it has, to, it has to feed off of something, you know, like a virus. It has to feed off of something. Um, and that's how we should understand evil. That's how we should understand vices. That at the root of them, there is something good that's been malformed. There is something good in envy in the sense that you ought to care for possessions. You ought to value the gifts that God has given you. But you should not want the gifts of others. And you should not look at them a particular way because they have something and you don't. But this is good. This is evil. I want to cite two things you said and then how you extend them. Okay, I'll try. You, know, you said that there's always more good than evil. And on the, on the cross, Christ took on all the evil. And it did marvelous good. Mm -hmm. We look at what the Bible says about end times and how the evil overcomes. And we, just, my God just lets everything go. I'm just wondering... What you would say about well, I don't think God lets everything go. I think there are... Um, I think we, you know, we could look at those passages in Thessalonians and Revelation and look at and interpret them um, in a way in which there is a falling away. As we'll get to... Well, we won't get to it today, but eventually we'll get to apostasy. There always will be a falling away. But what's interesting is, both with heresy and apostasy, as uh, the Apostle Paul talks about them, they're necessary in the church so that the truth will become more evident. So there you have, an, you have a strong assert, assertion that I find is interesting. When we read those passages, we often think, this is dire. Oh my gosh, the end times is going to be terrible. First of all, that runs up against the principle that God is sovereign. And it runs up against that God calls everything good and saves everything, and yet he's going to let it go to hell in a handbasket at the end of the day. I think that's problematic logically. The other thing that's interesting is even in the midst of evil, of apostasy and heresy, someone like the Apostle Paul can say, this is good for the church. There is nothing that evil can do especially post-Christ, that can disintegrate the created order that he has brought back. He is reconciling all things unto himself. And he's not letting it go. So I think it's very important. That, that's why I think within this virtue and vice tradition conversation, we have to have a better understanding of good and evil and God's sovereignty and perhaps the unfolding of history. However, your, whatever your eschatological views are, one that you can't hold is that at the end of the day, God's going to let this thing go, and it's going to go to hell. You can't hold that as a Christian. That's, that would be heresy. That would be modern-day heresy. Because he's sovereign, because he redeems, because he's reconciling. Now, we don't know what it's going to look like at that day when the trumpet sounds, but he will still be sovereign, and things will still be integrating and being redeemed and saved. So I, I don't think that we can say that it's going down. We have to say... It's going to hell, right? What's that? Much does go to hell. What, what is the much? Well, uh, we know the evil angels are going to up there. We know Satan's going to up there. It's probably not a name for it. Mm -hmm. because, you know, it's not what hell is today, what it's described at the end. We, all, we also know how many angels are going to have. 
third is going there. Yeah, I'm Two not, thirds is going there. I'm not arguing about all the good that God does. I'm just, I'm just trying to find out. I don't think everything is good. I, I just wanted to say one of the things that I found myself wrestling with on this is I think sometimes I think I put my um, love of the country that I live in. Um, you know, I <clears throat> I see things changing there, and I have to just accept that what God, what you said, we don't know what it's going to look like. Just because we see things going wrong around us doesn't mean that God's sovereignty won't be over all on his creation. Oh, what we love about our life right now is not what he might say. And we have to accept that because he is God. And that's all. Thank you. Yeah. And this is not a class, this is not a class on eschatology, but I would say this, just noting in church history. Almost every generation thought Christ was going to return. The fall of Jerusalem, Augustine in Rome. Not, didn't happen. And yet, think about the conditions that we had 100 years ago that we said, wow, God was really moving here. And maybe America is going to hell in a handbasket. But we do not know if there will be another epoch of history. God just keeps redeeming. God keeps saving. The good always emerges. And it's always more than evil. <clears throat> Uh, two verses that come to mind with this are, um, uh, I forgot the first one, but the second one was uh, God gave them over to the desires of their hearts. And the uh, first one was uh, vessels of destruction fitted for destruction. So even though things are going poorly, his hand is still in that, in the fact that he will use it for his overall good. Let's, yeah, great, and I'm sorry we, we didn't even get to any of the minor vices today for faith, but we'll get there. This is all good. But, yes, apostasy and heresy, the Apostle Paul can say those are good for the church. Now, I would also invite us to consider, you know, when we talk about the Pharisees who have what, in the New Testament, a dullness of mind. He gave them over to the evil desires of their heart. He spoke in parables so that they wouldn't understand. Why is he doing that? Well, maybe it's because that will lead to more people coming to the kingdom, not less. We have to think theologically and analyze this within the bigger picture. And the principle, at the very least, is he is sovereign over everything. And he doesn't, I don't think, this is, a, this is a little speculative, I don't think we can say he wants more people in hell than he does in heaven. We have to believe that he is sovereignly working through things for the salvation and reconciliation of all things. That is a Christian principle. And so while we're going to look at vices and say, oh, that's disgusting, oh, I actually do that, and these sorts of things, we also have to see the core good there. As the Ten Commandments indicate, we ought to care about our possessions. We ought to care for creation. We ought to take care of things, but not be possessive and not let it lead to, I'm going to treat my neighbor a particular way because they have better things than I do. There's good. And this over here is a deviation from the good. So as we look at this, let's remember this. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the ways in which you are present to us. The ways that you are present to us in the fullness of your Son, but also the sparks the sparks of truth and beauty and goodness that are found throughout your created order. And you are present. We are not deists, Lord. We do not believe that you're out there somewhere in space and you're just letting this machine run. You are active. Your spirit 
as it once did hovering the waters, is here in your church actively working. Lord, we ask that you would convict us and help us to lean into what you're doing. May we participate and become the kind of image bearers who are virtuous and following you and living life in you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here. Let me know if you have any other questions. Have a good rest of the day. Let's go confess and celebrate and worship. To God be the glory.